This is Relationship Truth Unfiltered, a podcast that ditches destructive traditions and delves into real biblical teaching about relationships. Welcome. I am Leslie Vernick here with Julie Von Black. Julie is a survivor of three abusive relationships when she discovered her journey program with Abuse Recovery Ministry Services, also known as ARMS, and that saved her life. Julie now serves as the Women's Ministry and Educational Director at ARMS and is a certified domestic violence advocate. Julie, I am so glad you're here and for many reasons, but you just almost had a near-death experience. Would you share that with our audience? Because I think the lesson you learned is powerful. I will. Yes, you're the first to hear it, (laughs) actually, except for family and friends and uh, my Facebook community. And I guess I'll have to count the uh, hospital personnel because as I woke up, I was very busy uh, jabbering about my experience because it was it was absolutely amazing. So I had a severe allergic reaction. Um, I am an allergic person. I carry an EpiPen and I have all my things. And it started in my home and I was by myself. My husband happened to be out uh, at the time. And I just, I started feeling really sick. There were things going on I'd never seen before. This was, if this was a reaction, it was a completely different reaction than what I'd ever had before. But God told me, he said, treat this like an aller- allergic reaction. And I said, okay. So I went and I took all my oral rescue meds, went back, sat on the couch. It started to get worse. And then it was louder. He said, Julie, he said, treat this as an allergic reaction. And I'm like, oh, oh, he means my EpiPen. So I went back to the kitchen, (laughs) grabbed my EpiPen, gave me an epinephrine shot for the first time in my life. I've never done it on my own before. Usually I get to the ER um, before. It got better for a few minutes and it got worse. And I'm like, I, you know, I'm not going to make it. I need to call 911. And and during that process, I kept, uh, I was fainting a lot and I kept laying on the couch. And every time I laid on the couch, I heard very clearly in my head, do not go to sleep, do not go to sleep. And I was like, okay, sitting up, called 911, got in the ambulance. And every time I passed out, it was a real, um, what I would call a fade to black experience. It started out kind of as a black grayish cloud and then it would go down to a pinpoint and then nothing. And I just, I couldn't stay up, but they got me into the ambulance and they were trying to keep me awake, of course. So here comes the questions, right? Who's the president? (laughs) Where do you live? What's your name? All these things as I was going out and going out and going out and they gave me all these meds and steroids and all that. And then they asked, they said, what do you do for a living? And I said, and this was really hard to talk because my mouth was swollen. And I was, it was felt like I was talking through cotton, but I told them I work for ARMS. I work for a Christian nonprofit who helps, you know, survivors of domestic abuse. And the ambulance guy said, wow, that's not a lot of stress, is it? <laughs> and I was going to answer. And instead, I blacked out again, only this time it wasn't black. It was gold. And there was a gold cloud in front of me. And um, sorry, a little emotional because it's only been a week or so. And then I started seeing movement behind that gold cloud. I saw people behind the gold cloud. And as soon as I saw that, these these gates snapped closed. And they were two kind of glass gates, kind of kaleidoscopy, a lot of orange, a lot of pink. There was flowers, there were pearls, uh, there was black onyx, and it closed. And I thought, oh, I thought I'm not supposed to see that yet. And then you know that feeling when somebody's standing next to you and you haven't seen them? <laughs> but you know, they're there. I felt that. And God was next to me. He was on my right. I didn't get to see him, but he said, he said, not now. He said, go. He said, there is still so much work to be done. And as soon as he said, go, I was vaulting backwards, like a hundred miles an hour. And he was still, uh, he was still with me because I heard the rest of the sentence and I woke up and it was so impactful that I thought everybody must have heard you know, there's still work to be done, but they were going about their duties. They were shooting the epi in at this point and say, rushing me to the hospital. Um, And so they got me stabilized, obviously. I'm home now, um, but it was quite the experience. And my my primary doctor did call and confirm um, to ask, you know, what was going on with my allergies. And I said, I said, I apparently flatlined in the ambulance and they looked at the records and they said, yes, yes, you did. And that kind of verified for me. I mean, I knew it had happened. I knew what had happened, but, um, you know, that was medical ver- verification that it had happened and that God's not done with me yet because, uh, Leslie and I were talking a little bit before the show. And I feel like sometimes those of us in this industry who are fighting against domestic abuse and, and trying to help people who have been there, you know, in a godly fashion are, 
are really getting attacked by Satan. And Satan does other, has done other things too, with arms, with our health, with our staff members. We're kind of in the crux of it, you know, right now. And yet he's not in charge. He is not in charge. He, he literally can take our bodies out and God allowed that to happen with me to take it out. But my soul does not belong to him, you know, and Leslie's soul does not belong to Satan. And when God says no, God means no. And so I, I am back to be a worker bee. <laughs> and I had no idea the number of people that we truly impact because as I posted my experience on Facebook, you know, and talk to people um, and people are calling and texting and emailing and say, I'm so glad you're back. And I wouldn't have made it three years without you and without arms. And two years ago, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have made it, you know, you guys were life-saving for me. And all this time, I really didn't think our work was as important as it is here on earth, but I discovered differently because God's not done. God's not done here. And I loved how you said to me, God told you, the work's not done. I'm not done. And, and the work that we do is not done. And I think that's such an affirmation, Julie, of God's heart for a woman in a domestic violent marriage, a, a woman who's being an oppressed, controlled, battered emotionally, physically, spiritually, however she's being battered off in all of the three. Um, God hates, God hates. And he's, and, he's, and he's not letting Satan win over your life or over this cause. And I just really feel that's so important. Amen. What got you started in this ministry? You said you were in three uh, abusive relationships. Talk a little bit about what you needed to learn. I think sometimes our women so often feel like they've been cherry picked by the abuser and then they have that. And that may be in some ways because they're such lovely godly women with no good boundaries um, and have told to be nice and make nice all the time. And I think there's some things in, in these experiences, not just to get safe, but to grow so that doesn't happen a second and third time. So what was it for you that the, the lessons that you learned in each of these experiences that helped you to get smarter each time? I took a long time to get smart. <laughs> I really did. Um, I did have some uh, childhood abuse growing up, not in the home, but from outside of the home and some predatory behavior that was used toward me. And as part of my healing process, I have gone back and made a timeline um, of all the abuse in my life and traumatic things. And while I was doing it and realized there was childhood abuse as well. I actually even got a call from a family member. I was, <laughs> I was, in, I was in the middle of a book signing. I was signing my book and I got this call and this person was apologetic and said that these things happened and I probably didn't remember them. Um, and I immediately had a panic attack. Um, I immediately went back to the table and said, I can't stay and tried to gather my books up um, and had another author that was there with me that said, you know, let, let me pray with you. And she did. And I stayed. And on the way home, I was like, you know what? I am not going to act like a victim anymore. I said, that's enough. That's enough. You know, I, I have control over me, over my emotions, my attitudes, my reactions, right? I have control over whether to respond or react. And I'm not going to do this. So I went home and I added it to my timeline and it was another notch. But yes, as I looked back, um, what brought me to arms and to her journey was a 17 year marriage. But when I look back on my timeline, there was two adult relationships that were also abusive in addition to that and, and in addition to you know the childhood. So I took a long time. I would literally tell people um, as I helped them or as I reached out to them, that I felt like I wore a t-shirt that said, abuse me, you know, I've been abused, abuse me again, abuse me, I've been abused, you know? And I really had to dig into what is it, you know, what, it, and you know, I hate to say, I try to be very careful with survivors, right? We don't want to point it at the survivor. Um, that's why we kind of in the industry disagree with the codependency, you know, idea, because it puts the blame in the wrong, wrong place. But God brought me to a point where I was like, you know, what is the common denominator <laughs> in all these relationships? And of course, you know, that was me. And I was not wearing a t-shirt that invited people to abuse me, but in a way I was, I was looking for that. Um, I was, I became very much a rescuer, very much a fixer, um, which of course in our, our industry can be deadly. Um, and I, I would look for people, you know, that needed me because that is where I placed my value was people needing me and me feeling good because I helped them and they were, 
they were grateful for that, which drew me to all, you know, all the wrong, all the wrong people. And of course, you know, I also grew up with what you mentioned, you know, with the pulpit, um, a strong Christian family. We were in church three days a week. My parents were uh, Awana directors and leaders, and we grew up taking the whole neighborhood to church with us when we went on Wednesdays and Sundays. Very strong, but also um, old fashioned in that regard that I heard that, you know, marriage is marriage. It is important. It is perhaps the most important thing. No matter what, you stay married. No matter what, you make it work. Um, people would wonder if my husband was actually a Christian. And then came that verse, I think it's in Matthew, right? That if you are the believer, you, you know, you stick it out, you stay, you be a witness um, and, and submit, right? Very early on in my marriage of 17 years, um, it was indicated to me that I, I needed to submit and accept him as head of household and, and do uh, what he wanted me to do. And make it work, make it work at all costs, at any price. Whatever it takes. Yep. Make it work. It's, I don't know why that's on us, but you know, it is. So I had to come to that, you know, to answer your original question, I had to come to that knowledge and understanding that number one, you know, I was worth more than that, um, that I was getting some kind of value and worth from these people who are unhealthy in my life and really work hard to heal and fill that with God, because God really is the only one who can fill that. No human ever can do that. You know, I think that's so important, Julie, and I just want to circle back to this because I think that we, we, um, you know, we, we also say the same thing, that you are not responsible for how your abuser treats you at all. But if you're being harmed, you are responsible for your well-being and your health and safety. And if you're not capable or able to do anything on your own behalf, that is says something about you. And sometimes it's those spiritual, well, I just need to suffer for Jesus, those spiritual half-truths and lies that we've been taught as women in order to keep the relationship alive, we have to just silence ourselves and sacrifice. And that's honoring to God. And nothing can be more dishonoring than letting someone treat you as an object to use rather than a person to love. So this is work that we do in all of life to grow and mature in our faith and in our emotional life and in our spiritual life. You said something that I thought was really powerful about that book signing. Like I now know how to control my emotions. They don't get to decide how I'm going to handle myself in this moment. I feel strong feelings when this person called me, but they don't get to decide how I'm going to handle this book signing. And that moment of prayer by a friend that sense of connection and community with another sister really helped you to remember that because sometimes in the moment of emotion, we just let emotions control. But I think that's so powerful. So in all of this, Julie, how did you find ARMS? How did you find the Abuse Recovery Ministry? So I was attending a church um, that had flyers in their restroom and talked about, you know, kind of what abuse was. And I tore, it off, tore the little tab off and took it home. And I think I lost it. And then I went back the next couple of weeks and got it again, which is very normal. We find that it takes a uh, lady sometimes even four to six months to call after they actually tear something off the tear off flyer. Um, but when I finally found it again, I'd come to a spot where I was like, okay, I know this relationship wasn't best for me. And I was making my moves to do what I needed to do. Um, and I wanna tell other people, I wanna tell other women that this is not God's plan for them. You know, that and we when we hear that a lot at arms um, at, with calls, I guess this is just God's will. No, you know, abuse is never God's will, God's plan for you. And so I ripped that off and I and I called them and they, of course, you know, obviously I wasn't ready to lead anything at that point or come on board with arms. They sent me to group. Um, I had an extremely patient leader. It's um, the group is called Her Journey and it's 15 weeks, but it just rotates. So after we uh, end with less than 15, we start over extremely patient leader who actually, I think, worked for the office and saw my saw my potential, saw my desire. But literally, I would sit there almost every lesson and, and God would just invoke amazing, amazing feelings and thoughts. Um, and I would leave with tears rolling down my face with almost every lesson because it was so on cue and it was so on board with everything I was feeling and all the emotions and God's word and what he really says, you know, about abuse and my value and my worth and all those things. And we even have a lesson on like what submission is, submission versus oppression and all these things that we learn, our submission are actually oppression. Um, we 
you know, learn that demanded submission is not submission at all. If it's demanded, it is oppression, you know, and, and all these lessons that were so key. So I knew I wasn't ready to lead yet and they knew as well. So I took um, three cycles of her journey just over and over again. I did the little homework. It's not required, but it does help you kind of delve in a little deeper. I got the books. This stuff was working out in my own life, even though it was still up in the air. And there's a lot of post-separation abuse, you know, as well. And then, you know, eventually I did volunteer to be her journey leader uh, when I was ready. And I also volunteered to do their marketing from afar and did their website and all of that. Um, and then six years ago now, six years ago now, God opened the door for me to come on staff as the women's and educational director with ARMS. This is such a beautiful story because God doesn't waste the bad that happens to you. Even, you know, even this ambulance ride, God's not going to waste that, right? He's going to use it for his glory. You're going to tell about those golden gates and the message God gave you and that Satan doesn't win. But your personal experience with domestic violence actually qualifies you for the work that you do in a very special way. So often we feel so disqualified, like we're damaged goods, like we don't have anything to offer because we let this happen or because this happened to us, however we're shaping it in our mind. And yet God uses the weak things of the world, the broken things of the world to, to shine forth his glory. And so how do you think your personal experience going through domestic violence yourself impact how does that impact the work that you do daily, both personally as well as with the women that you serve? Well, first of all, I think I've kind of changed my mindset. And I think I think that God calls us because of our weaknesses and because of our experiences. And, you know, we sit there and we feel God can use it. And certainly he does. But I think there's times in our lives he's like, no, you know, you've had this experience, you know, come forward. You know, and, and I, I have phone calls several, you know, several days a week with ladies who have been there and done that and are survivors um, and are feeling called a small percentage too. Now, granted, not all survivors are able or ready and that's okay. Right. And God may call them into, you know, into other areas, but I feel that there's great power in it. And I'll give you an example because, you know, we do get calls and I'm not the main phone answer or admin is, but at times we're all on the phone. Um, like this morning after a holiday, it's rang like 30 times this morning. Right. And I'm picking it up, picking it up, picking it up. And when they call and they're in crisis, you know, I, my, my, I don't want them to focus on me. I want to focus on them. But as soon as I say something like, you know, I've been there and I get it, or I've been in your shoes, they're like, oh, and you can feel, you can feel the relief just pour off of them because, you know, just like in my experience, uh, these ladies have probably told several people already about their abuse or tried to talk sense to their abuser. Right. And had people shake their heads or had people kind of think, you know, kind of like when I went to heaven, I still have some people shaking their heads, you know, over that. I, and in fact, when I got that experience, I was like, huh, it's kind of like coming out of abuse. Some people are going to look at you like, what are, you know, are you crazy? You know, did this really happen? But there's that, that, that relief that they have that all of a sudden somebody gets it, somebody understands and they can talk to this person because this person, you know, has been there. Now, not everybody who works with arms is a survivor. And I think it's a good balance you know, to have both of us, um, but some of us are. And so I think that's a huge help. I've had ladies come after up to me after sharing my story, you know, at ladies events, for instance, and, and say things like, you know, I, I didn't realize what's going on at home shouldn't be going on at home. Can we talk more, you know, because there's a lack of education, you know, in the area. And at ARMS, we teach eight types of abuse. We don't just teach the, you know, the the physical and the emotional and the sexual. We also teach, you know, we teach psychological and verbal and spiritual abuse and property abuse and animal abuse. Um, and so, you know, the world will go along with, you know, if you don't have a black eye, if he hasn't pushed you down the stairs, it's not, you know, it's not abuse, as you know, you know, in your books, but it is abusive, even if it's psychological, you know, slash verbal abuse. And so I do get that, you know, at events that people are like, I finally, you know, I finally get it. Um, one of the gals who posted after my heaven experience was like, you know, you walked me through three years ago, I would not be where I was, you know, where, where I am now without, you know, God using you um, in that regard. So, you know, if God calls you and if you're willing, it can be an amazing, you know, experience and make a, make a huge difference. At the same time, I would just like to say those of us who have been there, I think have to focus a little more sometimes on our self-care and be very, uh, very wary of that, that it can build up working with these people day after day who we love so much, right? And we have to guard our hearts from that, but also be aware that there's a point in time sometimes where God's saying, 
take a break. It's okay, you know, get your mojo back and come back and be, you know, even more powerful and don't burn yourself out on it. Something's not right. That much you're sure of. What you're not sure about, whether you're in a difficult marriage or a truly destructive one, would you like to know the answer to that question? Go to lesliewernick.com forward slash start and get Leslie's free quick start guide. It's a one page resource that will give you clarity on what you're really dealing with and what your next step should be. Not facing the truth, it may feel safe, but you already know it's not safe for your heart. Don't keep living in confusion. Go to lesliewernick.com forward slash start. We'll be there for you every step of the way. I think you've said something really important, Julie, that I just want to circle back around, and that is there are different kinds of abuse, but one of the common denominators of all kinds of abuse, and this is really helpful for those of you who are saying, I don't know if this is abusive, is this idea of coercive control. So if they're using their fists or threats of physical harm to control you, to get you to sleep with them, to get you to sign a co-sign on a loan, to get you to do what they want you to do. That's not submission, that's coercive control. But they may not use their fists, they may actually use the Bible. And so they're using verses to control and bully and intimidate you. That would still be considered abuse, not leadership. Or they may actually use the money in the family to control you. So if you have no access to credit cards, if you have no access to the ATM machine, or you have no idea what your taxes are, what you've paid, what you've not paid, um, what kind of debt you're in, what kind of retirement account you have, all you are dependent on is the benevolence of your husband to give you a monthly or weekly allowance to use. That's a pretty effective way of controlling you, isn't it? And so, Absolutely. so yeah. those who are listening in our audience, it may not be anything that you're recognizing as first order abuse. He's not screaming at you. He's just telling you you're not following God's word and you're a Jezebel spirit and you're not doing what the Bible says, or he's the head of the household and he makes the money. So it's his money and he's going to give you the money that he thinks you need to use. But if you need extra money that you think you need to use, that's not allowed. So be careful and look for the areas of you don't have a choice, you don't have a voice, and you are not able to use your God-given agency to decide. And it can even be done non-verbally, you know, we, um, or very subtly, you know, with verbal. So we've had cases of, you know, ladies who have been in a relationship for years and don't have any control over any, any power over anything because he's taken it all, but he's done so by saying things like, you don't have to do that. I will take care of it. Or, you know, don't worry about that. Or I know your, you know, your strong point isn't finances and mine is, so don't worry about it. You know, I got it. And it comes across as kind and gracious, loving and merciful until you get to a point where you realize, like you said, you don't know anything about, you know, your logins or your password or your bank account and all of that. And so it can also be done in very subtle measures. And that's kind of why I think it's important to really pull that apart and look at it deeply, you know, and, and test it. I, I go to him, go to him and say, you know, I am, you know, what does something happen to you? I'm, I'm concerned if something happened to you, I have no idea even how to access, you know, this or this or this, can we plan an afternoon or whatever and sit down and go over all these things. And his reaction is going to tell you, you know, a lot. If his reaction is absolutely, honey, you're right. We need to do that as soon as possible. And, you know, sorry about that. Let's do that. That's one thing. If his reaction is you've got nothing to worry about, you know, I've got it all up here and nothing's going to happen to me and da, 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 or even gets angry or mad, then that tells you all you need to know. You know, abuse is about power and control. It's not about any kind of equality, any kind of respect, any kind of honor. It's about him having power, you know, over you in those circumstances and really feeling entitled, you know, to have that power over you. And like, that's the right thing when it indeed is not. That confusion over what is biblical headship can add to that confusion. What is it? Is, is biblical headship mean that your husband gets to make your decisions? Or is that more of a parental role? And do you really want your husband to function as your dad? And then how does that feel in the bedroom? I mean, so I don't right. <laughs> oh dear. You know, right. So I don't think that God is asking a grown up woman who makes a decision to get married to all of a sudden function as a child who doesn't get a decision anymore. So I think this is something we're just encouraging you who are listening to think about. 
Julie, you mentioned her journey that you took that three times. Can you tell us more about that program and who is it for? Yeah, it's an amazing program by ARMS and ARMS stands for Abuse Recovery Ministry and Services. We're at abuserecovery.org and um, her journey, it was developed first. Uh, ARMS actually has three programs. We have two, they're all biblically based, but two programs are based on intervention. So it's for people who have been abusive, but her journey is what they developed first. And it was for survivors, for victims of domestic violence. Um, ladies 14 and, and older. We've had teenagers take it and be very helped by it as well. It is intended to be a, a program for intimate partner abuse, um, but we as leaders adjust that because we've had so many people come in that are you know, victims of child abuse and maybe you know they're not in a bad relationship now, but they're working on overcoming that their mom, you know, was incredibly controlling, you know, as an example. And so we leaders, when we know those people are in our group, you know, the concepts, you know, are the same. And so we will, we will kind of, kind of make it for them, you know, as well. It is 15 lessons. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, there's, there's some amazing lessons. Like first one is coming out of denial. So we talk about the eight types of abuse that we teach and what that includes. We talk about the cycle of abuse. We talk about um, the stats. We talk about, you know, that God has seen all of these things that have happened behind closed doors and believes you, unlike everybody else. Um, lesson two goes into boundaries, how to set them, when to set them, you know, when your yard should be adjoining and when they wouldn't. We have lessons on what to do with your anger, with your loneliness, with your uh, depression. Uh, toward the end of the curriculum, we get to a point where we work on what we would call a, kind of a relapse permission plan. You know, what can you do to prevent from going back into abuse? Because so many of us either go back to our person or go back to another person, as I did as well, unless we really have a plan and accountability in place um, as we gather our strength, you know, over over that time. So it's an incredible program. Over 46,000 women have gone through it. It is free. It doesn't cost. It's a great complement program to like Leslie's program, um, to like the Flying Free program with Natalie Hoffman. Um, if you're getting therapy of, or coaching or counseling, it's a great addition to that um, as well. And we are international as well. So we have groups as well in Kenya and Uganda, uh, Canada, Mexico, and soon to come in other countries as well. And talk about the other side. What are the programs that you have? You mentioned two kinds of programs to help abusers. Where are those programs? Where, what are those programs and how might they find them? Oh, they're so amazing. And the reason I, uh, you know, I, I just trained probably last year, just trained for the intervention side of things for arms as well. Mankind and virtue are the programs and they are biblically based intervention programs for people who are controlling <clears throat> and abusive. Again, biblically based. Um, a lot of the concepts we teach in all three programs um, are similar, but we teach them differently. So like for mankind and virtue, there's also a couple lessons on what submission really is and what God meant by submission as an example, um, you know, speaking with respect, they read a book, they read two or three books, they do homework, they recount their abusive incidents, they, when they do recount their abusive incidents, they have to list all eight types that were involved of abuse in their incident. Um, they do homework that really talks about their, you know, when, when this happened, they responded this way. And then we go into, you know, what could you have done and how did this affect the other person and what can you do next time? And what would have been a Christ-like response, you know, to this situation instead of being abusive? Those programs, um, they are held regularly in the greater Portland area for men and for women um, all over greater Portland. But we also have training available. So we do have people currently taking training to open Mankind and Virtue in their areas because our recidivism rate, um, literally, you know, the national recidivism rate of rearrest for people is up to, you know, 65, sometimes 70 percent. And our rate is five to seven percent. So if somebody successfully makes it through Mankind and Virtue and puts an accountability program in place um, and does those things and does them well, and really, of course, you know, feels convicted by the Holy Spirit and wants to make a change, um, it has a very high success rate um, for, for changing their lives. So most, it is a year long. Um, it's not the 15 weeks like her journey. It can take 36 to sometimes a year and it's performance and goal-based. And so sometimes more than a year for some people. 
that needed a very bit, a, a little bit longer. Um, but it is a, a very successful program in that regard. And these are in-person sessions, correct? At, in Portland, yeah. right? Okay. We did. We did have to go to Zoom during COVID, and that that was a rough one. Yeah, we we had to pull them all back to, to in person intentionally for intervention, for accountability purposes mostly, um, but much more effective in person than online. Yes. Yeah. If someone's listening and wants to get involved, how might they do that? What's in, what's in, you know, what are the opportunities for them to get involved with Arms? You can call us. I will give you that info. I also want to note that um, our founder, Stacy, has written um, a book called On the Front Lines of Abuse. It's a pretty quick read, but it's super informative. It is really a call to our churches and our faith community um, and what to do and how to respond to a victim and how to respond to a perpetrator. The safe things to do, the not safe things to do, some risk assessment and safety planning to make sure that they are helping helping well, um, and how they can set that example in their church of what God says, which is protect, you know, protect your sheep, protect the sheep. Um, and so that's a good resource. Um, our, our website is abuserecovery.org. There is a resource page that might be very helpful for some of you, but yeah, you can give us a call or send us an email through the site. And we would love to talk to you more about how you're feeling called. Often when people call, they don't know how they're feeling called yet. They just know they're feeling called. So some of our job at times is to kind of walk people through, you know, why don't we start with this? Why don't we start with our, you know, we have a, we have a um, DVAP training, which is domestic violence advocacy training. So it's a certified uh, faith-based domestic abuse advocacy training uh, that we've written that people will take. It's about 35 to 40 hours. And so oftentimes we'll start them with that. Um, and if they decide to go more than that, then there's also the intervention training available and group hours and things like that. Or, or maybe it's just, you know, becoming a Her Journey leader and holding a group in their church or in their county or in their city to, to help the women um, that are in their area. Lots of options. Yeah, I'm curious, how are the churches in the Portland area uh, with, especially the, you know, Christian conservative churches uh, in your area? How are they, how are they in re receptivity to your ministry, to your message, to opening up their doors to your educating them and allowing women from their church to be supported by you? I think we probably have a mix, just like everybody does. I would love to say that we've made such a difference in 27 years that everybody opens their doors to our program and recognizes that there's domestic abuse in their church. But uh, that is not the case. We find, um, first, for instance, if I'm going to approach a church about holding a Her Journey group, I find they are 10 times more receptive if they are already holding recovery groups. So if they are doing Celebrate Recovery or Grief Share or Divorce Care, you know, any or Embrace Grace, any of those programs, um, they, they usually have a care pastor, you know, there or somebody in charge of those things and they're much more open. If they have nothing, it's a much, much harder sell. So here's an example. We had uh, my developmental director had gotten a hold of a church uh, in Portland to talk about uh, some potentials and some fundraising. And they said, you know, they weren't interested. And I'm like, well, let me follow up. I'll see if there's any, you know, women pastors on staff. And, you know, I, I called them and they literally said, we do not have an abuse problem in this church. And I said, I'm, you know, I didn't know what to say. I think they finally hung up on me, but I went to their website at that point and they had 70 or 80 staff members and lay people all listed all their pictures, the elders, leaders, and they were all male. And I thought to myself, you think you don't have an abuse problem in your church? And I, I, I'm sorry, but I feel like it does start, and especially spiritual abuse. I just finished a, writing a class for our leaders on a deep dive into spiritual abuse because it starts at the pulpit. It starts at the pulpit, my friends. And if we don't feel like, you know, women should be in leadership, and that's how we're interpreting the scriptures, that women shouldn't be in leadership, then there is already a power over mentality that is at play in that church that drifts down, you know, to those people. On the other hand, I've had some churches that have mostly male leaders and are fine with that, but they don't act that way at all. They adore women. They feel like women should be involved. My husband does pastoral story work and he says without women, he says, we're missing half the story. He goes, if I don't have women on my team that advises and coaches, he goes, you know, that's, that's a fail. That's, that's a big fail. And so there are still churches that take that male, you know, leader mentality are okay with that. But you know what? They see that there's a power over, they see, um, and they're more able to when people come to them to say, okay, you know, let me help you and let, let me work on this. But I do believe the example in the pulpit is what set it up for us, especially with 
uh, spiritual abuse. And these men who are abusive or maybe have a bit of narcissism in them or whatever will go to church and, and glom onto that, you know, the men are the power and this versus that and go home and use it, you know, against their women. And that's never what God, never what God intended ever, ever. So it's very important that our churches set a better example. And it starts in that pulpit. It starts with that lead pastor saying enough is enough. And we're going to, we're going to do our part, you know, to help with this problem, because the reality is sadly, the stats in the church are the same as outside the church. And that makes me so sad to say that, but it is true. Yeah. And when you think of a congregation that big with that much staff, you know, one in four women are being abused in his church and probably they don't feel safe enough to be honest about that. Exactly. Yeah. You mentioned your husband, Julie, so you're in another relationship. <laughs> I am. And uh, how are you different from the woman you were at the beginning? And how is this relationship different? So different. <laughs> so different. Yes, we've been married 10 years now. So, um, yeah, we uh, we actually met in Bible college uh, 35 years ago. <laughs> Both uh, were just friends. Both went on our way. He was from Pennsylvania. I was from the Northwest. Um, uh, and God really worked a miracle there too. It, it really did. He, um, unfortunately, uh, they vacationed every year at Oregon. Um, his wife was in an accident, sadly, unfortunately, and it was put on Facebook with our, um, our college group. And I'm like, well, I'm in Portland, I better go help. And I did. And, uh, you know, she, she lost her battle. She uh, never woke up from her head injury that she got and she had surgery and everything. And uh, she passed away. Um, so that was very sad. And at that point, I was already um, divorced from my abuser. Um, and, you know, Bill and I kind of looked at each other a year later and were like, you know, there's something a little more here than than meets the eye. You know, what's got what's God got going on? It was pretty it was pretty astounding how he put it all together. I used to tell people um, it was such a it was so orchestrated that I knew it was God orchestrating it because it was very carefully orchestrated. Um, and then my former husband, who was abusive, also passed away um, at that point. And God released me from that completely, you know, from that relationship. And Bill is, you know, he's amazing. He's, he's just amazing. I'm so grateful. So he treats me with honor and love and respect and wouldn't ever dream of, you know, lifting a hand. He feels the calling of God and the love of people very deeply. Um, and that's always a priority in his life. And I'm just, I'm very grateful for, you know, for a second chance with somebody who is an amazing person who treats me like a jewel, like God would want. So. And how are you different? Yeah, I'm different because I make different choices. I mean, I make much better choices now. I, you know, there was a very long time in my life where I would see red flags and not pay attention to them. Um, or I would go with that. I see there's a red flag there, but I love him. Right. And I need to, I need to save him. You know, I'm, I have, I've blossomed. I've absolutely blossomed. You know, I, I have gifts and skills that we can't use when we're in abuse because we are in survivor mode. And I was coming out of abuse and God was like, get back to writing, do these things, do these gifts I've given you, you know, help people. And I'm like, oh, do I have to? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, oh, you know, and, and in doing so, that was not only part of my healing, but it just, it blossomed me, you know, it, it really did. So I, I've come to know in my life that I can't really worship him fully unless I'm using gifts and talents that he gave me. And I actually read an, a book the other day from an author and she literally said, if we don't use our gifts and talents, we're actually shorting the, the body of Christ since that's what he developed us for, you know, in that. And I was like, wow, you know, that's so strong. So I regularly use my gifts and talents. I'm in an industry that, you know, that I'm helping obviously. And apparently God sent me back to do, you know, back to do more. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm confident. Um, I, I'm in my abundant life. And that's what I tell my gals. I said, you know, abundant life is, is not possible when you are in abuse in your life, your abundant life that Jesus planned for you comes after comes after you say no more. And maybe that isn't leaving. Maybe that's just setting very hard boundaries, right? And taking care of yourself. But it comes afterwards. That's when Jesus fulfills things and fulfills your life and sends you out to whatever mission he has for you um, and blesses you tenfold because he will do that because you're worthy of that. And he loves you. He loves you that much. So well said. Thank you, Julie. We appreciate you and ARMS and all that you do for women who are in domestic violence situations, as well as the men who want to change. We need more Christian programs for men who, I call them unaware, immature 
people that they may have grown up where that's what they saw in their home just like you know when we grew up that's what we saw in our home and so we may not even recognize abuse as we're listening to this until we start hearing this and like oh my gosh i remember a client once said to me you mean your husband never calls you the b word and i said i'm quite sure he thinks it but no he's never a <laughs> good answer there Leslie. <laughs> She just couldn't fathom that, that that kind of abusive speech wouldn't be normal in a household. And so I think that educating what is healthy and normal is really important, including for the abuser, because sometimes they've just grown up in a system where this is how men treat women. This is how men act. This is what men do. And a godly man does take power and control. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what God tells them to do. And so for those men who might be listening, who really are coming to realize that that is not. Jesus could have used his power to silence all of his attackers. He didn't. And so he doesn't use power to control people. And so it's really important that if you want to change, there are things available to help you change. Chris Moles has a great program on the East Coast. You have a great program on the West Coast. We need something in the Midwest. But um, just, just to know um, what's available out there for you if you're listening and you have misused your power and authority for selfish purposes. That is not why God gives you your power or your authority. And so thanks, Julie, so much for sharing what ARMS does. And also the part for the abusers is really important because we do need Christ-centered programs. Because like you said, your recidivism rate is far lower than the secular programs because I think we need not just to change our mind, but we need to change our heart and only God can do that. Correct. Yep. Amen. Thanks for listening. I hope that if you are in this kind of situation, you will go to the show notes and look up arms and join a journey group or join conquer or some other place where you are going to get the help you need to become the woman that God called you to be, even if your marriage fails. Julie, would you pray for our women here? Absolutely. I'd be honored. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time with Leslie and this this common ground we have, God, in, in sharing what your word really says, what it really says about abuse and, and treatment and that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, God, and our minds and our souls, all of our beings are yours and deserve to be treated with the utmost honor and respect and equality. Heavenly Father, I just pray for people that might be listening who <clears throat> perhaps have listened a lot and perhaps are coming to a point in their lives where they realize that this is not normal marriage or partner conflict going on at home. This is something much deeper. This is this is a mentality, Lord. Our, our behaviors are based on our beliefs is what it comes down to. And whether we are a controlling person or whether we are um, a victim or a survivor of that person, we are acting out of that belief system, God. And sometimes that belief system is wrong and not what you taught of us at all. So God, be be with the people who are listening to to delve in. There are resources, there are books, there are, there are programs, there are things, uh, education out there on the internet, God, and they can become informed and educated and make good choices with you, with you at the helm of that, God. And I pray that you would give them the courage to do that today and the strength to do that today, to reach out um, and to know that they are not alone that their abuse is not their fault and that there is help available. It is never our fault when it happens to us, Lord, but it is our responsibility to choose to heal. It is our responsibility to choose to set boundaries. It is our responsibility to say no more. I will no longer allow abuse in my life. God, give them the strength to do that today. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Relationship Truth Unfiltered. If you need clarity on whether your marriage is difficult, disappointing, or destructive, go right now to leslievernick.com forward slash start. It's totally private and will help you get clear on your next step. Until next time, may God bless all of your relationships with Him, with yourself, and with others.